We'll move to a second context for understanding wisdom, prophecy, and knowledge in 1 Corinthians, that of women in the religious and political life of the ancient world. 1 Corinthians 11 says that women who are praying and prophesying in the ecclesia, in the community, need to have their heads covered. You might well ask, what's the cultural context for this practice? Were there women in religious and political life in antiquity? You might ask, wasn't there patriarchy in the Roman Empire? And the answer would be yes, of course. A scholar, Elizabeth Schuster Firenze, has actually coined the term kyriarchy to talk about the Roman Empire, to talk about the rule of the master, or the kyrios, and the way in which that system organized hierarchical relations between men and women, masters and slaves, uh, parents even, and children. And yet in the Roman Empire, women's leadership was common. Women were priestesses for goddesses, especially elite women. Women were represented in public as models of decorum, religiosity, benefaction, and other virtues, including being in leadership positions. Let me give you one example, that of Livia, wife of Octavian, the first emperor, mother of the emperor Tiberius. She's represented here in this sardonyx gem as having the attributes of two goddesses. Ceres, the goddess of grain, you can see that she's holding shafts of wheat. And also the goddess Venus, a dress is slipping from her shoulder, associating her with that goddess who was understood to be the progenitrix of the imperial family. Okay, you might say, but she's an empress, surely she gets depicted. But let me give you a second example from 2nd century Perge in Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey. Plantia Magna, a wealthy woman there, donated an enormous gate complex. The niches within this gate complex held statues of the gods, of founders of the city, of the imperial family, and statues of Plantia Magna's own family. She herself is named by titles in inscriptions around the city. She's called Daughter of the City priestess of Artemis Pergaia, who's the main goddess of the city. She's named Demiorgos three times. She's called priestess of the mother of the gods for life, the first and the only. And she's named high priestess of the imperial cult. The gate complex is dedicated in her name. Her husband, brother, and son are referred to in relation to Plantia Magna, not the other way around, as was usual. And she herself is depicted in this statue as modest in typical Roman dress. But we see in a third example that Greco-Roman priestesses or prophetesses who might not necessarily have been wealthy are also depicted in statuary. In this sculpture of a Roman woman from the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, we see someone who's probably a priestess in the midst of religious practice. She's 180 centimeters tall and thus roughly life-sized, over five feet. She's made of Parian marble. You'll notice that she's modestly dressed. She's wearing the stola of a Roman matron, and her left hand gathers up the heavy folds of her clothing. She's looking a bit to the right in the direction of her sacrifice. With her right hand now lost, she's placing incense on a small altar, a theomaterion. She wears an elaborate hairdo, and a veil over her head indicates her piety and her religious practice. If you look closely at her face, despite the damage done to it, you can see that this is not an idealizing portrait. You can see the wrinkles, the nasolabial lines on her face. This is a portrait of the second century CE that indicates the seriousness of her enterprise. It's not an ideal face, perhaps because it's closer to a portrait and it doesn't depict her as youthful, but as someone who's older, who's somberly involved in worship, in practices of piety. Or we might think of the example of the Pythia, a prophetess at Delphi, who is said to have been chosen not from elite women, not from well-educated women, and not from among the virgins, but instead just a common woman from the countryside who channels the voice of the god Apollo. You might then question, well, maybe only in the Greco-Roman world, not the Christian or the Jewish aspects of that world, do we find women in religious leadership or political leadership. Let me give you a fourth example, then, of an authoritative woman leader in Paul's letters. In Romans 16, we meet a woman named Junia. It's a letter of recommendation. If you remember our first discussions of ancient letters, you'll recognize that this is just an extremely long and functional letter listing names and roles of various people. I'm going to read to you from Romans 16:7. Greet Andronicus and Junia, writes Paul, 
my kin and my fellow prisoners, people of note among the apostles, and they were in Christ before me. Your version of the Bible may say Junius, my kinsman, but this is a new interpretation first found in the 13th century and aimed at changing the woman apostle Junia into a male apostle. Scholar Bernadette Bruton has shown the history of the emendation, the change of the name Junia, a feminine name, to Junius, a masculine name. She's pointed out that the name Junius is unattested in Roman literature. In other words, scholars from the 13th century onwards made up this name. If you look again at Romans 16, you can see where many women are named by Paul, some with a good deal of praise for their roles in leadership. He mentions not only Junia, the rest of Romans 16 conveys the significant involvement of women in the early assemblies of which Paul was a part. Maybe you might think pagans or Greco-Roman religions had females in religious leadership and maybe those in Christ were more open to women and slaves and more egalitarian, while Jews were not. But first of all, we know that Paul is a Jew writing to people interested in becoming Jews in Christ. And let me offer also a fifth example of Jewish women leaders from inscriptions and other data collected by scholar Bernadette Bruton. In 2nd century Smyrna, modern-day Izmir, in Turkey, we meet Rufina in an inscription, which reads, Rufina, a Jew, head of a synagogue, built this tomb for her freed slaves and the slaves raised in her house. A copy of this inscription has been placed in the public archives. This inscription tells us two things. First, a woman was the head of a synagogue, and also that she was a religious leader who owned slaves something that reminds us of our focus on slavery last time and that we'll think about again as we encounter Christian religious leaders who owned slaves. Rufina is one among other Jewish women in antiquity who had titles and leadership roles in synagogues. What does this have to do with 1 Corinthians? From reading 1 Corinthians 11, we realize that there were Corinthian women who were prophesying. Any woman who prays or prophesies with her head unveiled dishonors her head. We also realize that in 1 Corinthians, Paul writes, women should keep silence in the churches. They're not permitted to speak. They should be subordinate. From this juxtaposition of chapter 11 and chapter 14 comes a question to apply to 1 Corinthians. We might conclude from reading the letter that there may have been authoritative Corinthian women prophets, as scholar Antoinette Clark Weyer has argued. And yet, the arguments for women's silence in the churches, for women's veiling in prayer and prophesying, while men lack veils, may have puzzled the Corinthians, especially in the context that they knew, the context in which Paul had women associates. The lists he has of women whom he praises as co-workers and apostles. This allows us to make a larger point about historiography, about the writing of history. If we can't imagine women or slaves in the historical record, then we create blind spots in our historical investigation. We won't see them. This leads us to make bad historical arguments, to invent wrongly the invention, for example, of the name Junius. Our historical blind spots can also limit our vision for religious communities today. For Christian communities that want to ground their practice, in the precedent of the earliest ecclesia or churches. We know that we do find evidence of women and perhaps even slaves holding offices and in leadership in those first communities.